thank you, Sherry, and thank you all for being here. Uh, when I first started my research uh, 15 years or, or so ago, I told my wife and my daughters, I said, hey, I'm going to study coal. And they said, coal? And uh, then and now, I still respond emphatically, yes, coal. <coughs> Touches a lot of the fabric of Alabama history and has influenced the lives of a lot of people in this state and vice versa. So hopefully uh, you'll gain some appreciation here of, of my study of the Cahaba coal field uh, in Alabama. If you notice the inset map up here to the left, uh, you'll see that Alabama has... Okay. Do I need to stay at the podium? Okay. There are four uh, coal fields in Alabama. The largest is the Warrior Coal Field, uh, centered around Jasper, Walker County, and the like. And that coal was used primarily to feed the iron industry of the Birmingham district. Cahaba is the second largest coal field. You see it here, it really kind of falls right along the Cahaba River Valley. Slightly to the east, just across the Coosa River, is the Coosa Coal Field. And then up to the north, around Sand Mountain, is the Plateau Coal Field. Uh, you'll notice that it's kind of larger geographically, but has the least amount of coal. Uh, the Cahaba field stretches 67 miles from southwestern St. Clair County uh, down to northern Bibb County. It follows right along, if you know the Birmingham area, right along uh, Interstate 459, uh, Acton Road, uh, named for the Actons who were early coal miners. Uh, River Chase uh, residential area is honeycombed underneath with old coal mines. So they had to drive the pylons deep uh, when they were building those houses in there. The, uh, the nature of the Cahaba field is kind of uh, strange. It's difficult because you have geological plates that are coming together that call fracture, cause fractures in the coal seams and the like. And you have some names like anticlinum and uh, synclinum that talks about breaks in the seams. Uh, they twist, they turn. Uh, there's even one seam right along in here that uh, is totally inverted. So they call it, it's called the overturned measures there. So when it came to charting coal, finding the seams, naming those seams and the like, it was a challenge to, uh, to figure out what seams went where because generally what they did was just follow stream beds, look for outcroppings, and then they would measure uh, size of the seam and then also sandstone shale layers that were between there. Most of the literature, until I began my work, uh, put the early stages of coal mining in Alabama around 1853. I actually moved that back four years to 1849, and I focus on this man, William Phineas Brown, who was a Vermonter, uh, came uh, south as he worked with his cousin in building canals and the like, did some work up around Muscle Shoals, then ended up doing some business uh, in New Orleans, over along the Yazoo River in Mississippi, and then along the Gulf Coast. Uh, ultimately, in the mid-40s, he was down around Point Clear and had the idea of building a hotel at Point Clear. Really a nice idea, wouldn't you think? Uh, turns out he, uh, he did not bring that to fruition because he married Margaret Stevens, who lived up at Wilton, two miles south of Montevallo in my hometown. Um, and she would not, after they married in 1846, she would not move to the coast. She insisted that William Phineas move north. So in 1849, she finally convinced him to do so. He moved up. They lived with her folks initially and then built a house on that property. And he began the first systematic coal mining uh, in Alabama, in what became Aldrich, just two miles west of Montevallo. Wilton actually was the railhead at that time, so he built a tramway from the pit mines in Aldrich to Wilton, where they would load from the tram cars to the rail cars and then take the coal by rail to Selma. Ideally, they would have liked to put it on the Cahaba River and floated it down on barge, but there are shoals at Centerville, the fall line on the Cahaba, so they had to use the rail to get it to Selma. Once it was there, then they could use rail or the Alabama River going eastward toward uh, Montgomery, or they could follow on down toward Mobile, New Orleans, and then other areas in the uh, Gulf area. Also used the rail to market the coal in Selma as, and then over toward Marion and Uniontown and other areas uh, in Perry County and the like. Joseph Squire really is the central figure in my study. He was an English uh, mining engineer who came to the United States in 1849 
uh, landed in the Northeast, worked his way across the Midwest, and then began mining operations along the Missouri River. Did that for about 10 years, and then in 1859, he heard about some extraction problems they were having in the Montevallo area, so he came to Alabama in 1859, and then worked uh, in alternate years for William Phineas Brown and uh, Brown's competition, the Alabama Coal Mining Company. And so he would renegotiate a contract with, uh, with the competition uh, each year. Brought a lot of uh, expertise with him, uh, state-of-the-art English mining techniques, and Squire ended up writing the 1890 Geological Survey of Alabama, which was a description of the Cahaba coal field. And, uh, you can still get an original copy from the Geological Survey in Tuscaloosa and pay $6.25, which was the price in 1890 because since it uh, was paid for with state funds, you know, as taxpayers, we can still get it. But he wrote the book describing the seams and the like with the Cobb Field, and in some of these books, he included a map, which I have displayed over here. Uh, and uh, I invite you to look at this after, after the talk. But he tries to use the two-dimensional map to, to depict uh, the three dimensions, uh, the depth of coal seams, but of course that's difficult. And so what he does is he uses cross-sectional uh, treatments to show the various seams and then the sandstone, the shale, and the other layers that are there. So uh, I think a geological masterpiece, and then he did the watercoloring himself, and so it, it really is a work of art as well. A remake that was done in 1922 is down here. It's just in black and white, but if you like, uh, I've put little stickies on there for uh, the different counties there, starting with St. Clair over here and then down to Bibb County along here. So uh, maybe some familiar areas that you, you'd like to see there. But Squire is, is really kind of the brains here. It takes him 30 years to, to chart this, collecting samples and, and moving throughout the area. One of the people he worked for was Isaac Taylor Titchener. And for you uh, folks who are familiar with the campus at Auburn University, uh, you know that there is a Titchener Hall there. Um, Titchener was the president of Alabama's Agricultural and Mechanical College from 1872 to 1882. Prior to that, he was the pastor, twice in fact, of First Baptist Church Montgomery but he was always interested in developing the mineral resources of Alabama. And so he uh, befriended Joseph Squire. They worked very closely together. And in fact, uh, at one point, uh, Titchener left the ministry, moved up to uh, central Alabama, was working with Squire to try to develop the, the coal in the field, but had a wife and a child die uh, within close proximity to each other or, or closely together. And so then he went back in the ministry uh, but then uh, remained interested in developing the coal regions of central Alabama. After he left uh, Auburn in 1882, he went to Atlanta and was the corresponding secretary for the Home Mission Board of the Southern Baptist Convention. And interestingly enough, in the correspondence that I used that are, were in Squire's papers, uh, found letters from Titchener, and he was writing on Southern Baptist Convention uh, stationery a letterhead there, so it's kind of kind of interesting. Another thing about Squire's um, writings, and I would say that, uh, tell you too, that William Phineas Brown's papers are here at the State Archives. Uh, Ken Penhale in Helena actually salvaged uh, many of Squire's letters and, and other correspondence uh, from a decrepit barn up in Helena and uh, has those at his home, but it was kind enough to let me use those. But the nice thing about Squire, he really was a friend of a historian because when he received letters, he would turn them over and draft his response in pencil on the back. And then would pull out his pink and his, and his ink well and then write the formal letter, mail that one. But for me, when I was doing that research, I could actually see both sides of the conversation uh, on the same sheet of paper. So thank you, Joseph Squire, for making my, my work uh, easier. This is the uh, railroad bridge at, uh, on the South and North Alabama Railroad. I mentioned that early on when Brown was, was mining uh, that the railhead was at Wilton. That was the Alabama and Tennessee Rivers Railroad. Later go, uh, turns and goes up toward Chattanooga. Uh, the South and North Alabama Railroad was designed to link Montgomery and Decatur, essentially bridging the gap between the Alabama River Valley in the south and the Tennessee River Valley in the north. I like this picture because it brings a lot of components together. This is Joseph Squire's 
home and office here in the center. Uh, you have the railroad bridge that goes across Buck Creek in Old Town Helena, and of course the railroad was instrumental in getting miners to the mines and then also getting the coal, <coughs> getting the coal to market. Some other personalities that were involved in this area, Truman Hemingway, Hemingway Aldrich, uh, was a banker from New York, came to Selma and then worked his way up here, actually came up and bought the old uh, mining uh, operations of the Alabama Coal Mining Company. And uh, then eventually uh, that area would become the town of Aldrich. He was joined after a few years by his brother, William Farrington Aldrich, uh, also from New York. And Truman uh, eventually sold his sh share to William. Then Truman went out to Blockton over in Bibb County and began uh, forming that mining community. William Farrington stayed in Aldrich and then the, the town bears his name and he stayed in control of that area until he retired in 1912. Another person involved here is James W. Sloss. You probably know him from Sloss Furnaces in Birmingham. Uh, he started in mining, was uh, a compatriot with Truman Aldrich, and then also Henry DeBard Laban. And those three really were instrumental in developing the Cahaba field. They relied uh, strongly on uh, Joseph Squire for his expertise, and then DeBard Laban provided a lot of the capital. Uh, and that, of course, was the inherited cap capital from uh, Daniel Pratt, who was Daniel Pratt's son-in-law. Uh, and in fact, DeBard Laban and Pratt, in 1876, rebuilt Oxmoor furnaces that had been destroyed by Wilson's Raiders uh, in 1865, uh, and then did a coking experiment there to see which of Alabama's coal uh, would coke more readily. And if you don't know about that process, uh, certainly you're familiar with coal, Right, it's, uh, it's just carbon, which is why I call it diamonds in the rough, right? Just need a little bit more time, a little bit more heat, a little bit more pressure, and you could wear that on your finger. Uh, but you take, uh, you take slack coal, which is uh, less than one inch in diameter, put it in a beehive oven, uh, and then burn it without oxygen, and it comes out as coke. And someone des described it to me that coke is to coal as charcoal is to wood. So it's uh, an intermediate fuel, and this has more tensile strength, so it would bear up in the blast furnaces when you put it in. The coal was soft, so it would crush with the weight of the iron ore and the limestone that you put in on top. Coke would stand up to that, uh, to that weight, and so you could get the blast hotter uh, and, uh, and produce better grade of, of pig iron. But uh, they coked the various uh, samples of coal at Oxmoor in 1876 and found that the coal in the warrior field to the northwest of Birmingham actually coked more readily than the coal from the Cahaba field. And you say, well, hey, it's all from the same state. It should be the same coal. Well, it was not. You have to measure the sulfur content, ash content, other uh, factors, impurities that are in that. And in fact, there are 17 different grades of coal. You go from anthracite, which is found up in Pennsylvania in the Connellsville region, that is the hardest and purest form of coal, and then uh, go the other end of the spectrum to peat, which uh, we certainly usually think of from in Ireland, a lot of peat bogs and things like that, but a lot of different grades of coal in between. Since the warrior coal coked more readily than the Cahaba coal, then DeBard Laban uh, Sloss and Aldrich left their interest in the Cahaba field and began to develop the warrior field. Pratt mines uh, were developed by them with Joseph Squire's uh, oversight and then those became captive mines providing coal directly to the Birmingham district. Eventually the, uh, Aldrich and DeBard Laban would end up back in the Cahaba field but uh, really since you have different grades of coal then you have different markets uh, and different uses and hence a different history. This is just kind of a, a photo to illustrate what these folks did. F people like Squire, he worked for Eugene Smith who was the state geologist uh, and it was Smith who actually commissioned with him to write the geological survey of 1890 but they would use Studebaker coaches like this, go out in the piney woods uh, following stream beds and the like, they'd set up camp and, uh, and then take samples, send those back to Tuscaloosa so that they could do some analysis and things like that. And overall, they would, uh, would chart what coal they could find and then project what was, what was there. Uncle Billy Gould is another kind of private entrepreneur uh, centered around Helena. 
He built some coke ovens right around his coal mines, his pit mines uh, in Helena. And the city of Helena has acquired that property now and is looking at uh, developing a, a walking trail and things like that right along Buck Creek in that area. But he was instrumental uh, in mining coal early on. He's a Scotsman who, who came to that area uh, in the early days. I mentioned William Farrington uh, Aldrich, who stayed in the town of Aldrich. This was his home, Raja Lodge, uh, no longer in existence. It went into disrepair and collapsed, but uh, really fascinating. Uh, you see the little uh, walkway that they built out here to this tree. They built it, uh, a tree house for their son, Farrington. Um, and the office building is back down here, just on the other side of the fish pond. Uh, where you had the doctor's office, the main office, so that's where the miners would get paid and things like that, called Farrington Hall, and it's still there. And uh, Henry and Rose Imfinger, who uh, grew up in, in Aldrich, have preserved that, just the two of them, with, with very meager resources, but have done yeoman's work and do that. In fact, they dug out this fish pond by hand, uh, and so you can still see where the fish pond is, but none of Raja Lodge uh, exists today. This is a description of the room and pillar method used to extract the coal. A uh, friend of my dad's, uh, Jess Shepard, was the son of the housekeeper of the president of the Little Cahaba Coal Company at Piper. When Jess grew up and became college age, uh, Walter Henley, who was the president of the company at that point, sent him to college. He came back and then became superintendent of the mine. So when I first started my research, I actually had an interest back in the 1980s, uh, at my dad's suggestion, I wrote Mr. Jess and asked him to kind of describe for me what was going on. And so he drew this, and I included this in the book. But the, uh -oh. the idea here is here's the surface. You have the tipple at the top. That's everything on top where you, where you tip the uh, coal cars that come out from the, uh, from the slope. You have the manway, which is the slope that the miners uh, ride their cars down to the, to the coal face underground. And then you have a parallel airway here with a big fan at the top because you have to keep the air circulating in there to keep the methane from building up and things like that. And then you have the slope here that would have the track so you'd pull that either initially with mules uh, who, that stayed underground and eventually when you had electricity then you'd have big uh, pulleys and cables that would pull it to the top here. Once you get down to the face then they assign different rooms that were about uh, 12 to 24 feet wide with pillars that were about six feet wide in between. That would hold up the roof and then the miners would go in and, ex and blast the coal and then shovel that out. Uh, getting rock out uh, obviously uh, was dead work. You didn't get paid for that, didn't get paid by the hour, just got paid for the coal that you mined. And that was one of the issues that many of the union organizers uh, voiced uh, as they became more involved, but uh, that's all dead work. Don't get paid for it, and, and now it's portal to portal. When you, when you leave to head to the face, uh, you're still getting paid, but back then it just was the, the coal that you could get out. The Roden Coal Company was at Marvel. Uh, the Rodens actually began over in Avondale, uh, affiliated with Sloss Furnaces, and uh, so they established really what amounts to what was considered state-of-the-art uh, coal mining uh, in the early 20th century. This is Marvel's one and two. Notice that the entryways are almost one on top of the other, and essentially what they were doing was mining two seams of coal, and the, the room and, rooms and pillars were identical. And so they'd have one crew mining on one le level and then another crew here. Uh, I don't think I would have liked to have been the folks on the bottom because you'd have to worry about cave-ins or something like that. But all that thing of shoring up the roof and all that, that was dead work too, so you didn't get paid for that either. This is Coleaner, also in Bibb County. Uh, it's kind of a sister town with Piper. Uh, the Little Cahaba Coal Company owned this. I liked this because uh -oh, it shows some of the uh, top house work. And of course, you had the miners who would go underground and do the mining there, but you also had top workers or day workers who would handle this, work the tipple, work the uh, machinery, have blacksmiths and carpenters and things like that to maintain this. So uh, different existence uh, for those on top of, on above ground as opposed to those who are underground. This is just a neat advertisement from the Aldrich uh, Mining Company. Notice that they designate different sizes here. Generally you have lump, which was used for home, home heating and the like. You had nut which was smaller, might be converted to natural gas uh, or used sometimes 
uh, to make steam, and then you had slack coal, which was less than one inch in diameter that was used for steam and to run locomotives, and also to make coke, obviously. Uncle, Char Uncle Charlie DeBard Laban is the son of Henry DeBard Laban. Uh, the elder DeBard Laban died in 1910, and Uncle Charlie inherited uh, his mines and his operations. Uh, Henry DeBard Laban and Truman Aldrich actually had be been vice presidents of Tennessee Coal and Iron uh, as they were getting established in Birmingham. But with the Depression of 1893, they were forced out of TCI, so came back to the Cahaba field. Uh, Aldrich working primarily in northern Bibb County and uh, Henry DeBard Laban moving into St. Clair County, and those are the areas that uh, Charlie DeBard Laban inherited. He was very anti-union uh, and, and created what he called welfare societies, uh, kind of a, a, his version of welfare capitalism, trying to create a contented workforce that was more interested in staying loyal to the company than in unionizing and forming labor unions and the like. Uh, he said he would close down the mines and let grass grow over the top of them before he allowed union organizers to come into his mines. And in fact, one time when uh, unionization was really uh, putting a push on, uh, on folks at Margaret and other areas, he put two machine guns at the top of the hill on the entrance to Margaret. And so he had this caravan of union organizers driving their way up there one evening, and the machine guns opened fire on them. One person was killed, another one was, was injured, and DeBard Laban actually was tried for murder uh, and was acquitted. Uh, so just protecting his interests, I suppose, but a very colorful character. Um, this is over at Blockton. This is uh, Blockton number three. There were 10 or 12 mines uh, at Blockton, and this was an Italian uh, community. Uh, had, had very much a culture uh, in slang. It was called Dago Hill. There still is, a, uh, is an Italian Catholic cemetery at Blockton that has been preserved uh, for all of these. So the, the communities grew up around the uh, entryways to the, to the various mines and the like. And you'll notice that many of these houses are on stilts up on the hillside. They might keep a goat or a cow <coughs> underneath there. Many of the women would have community uh, outdoor um, ovens and the like where they would bake their bread each day uh, and the like. Interesting too, obviously uh, Italian was, was the language of choice in this community and so you had a lot of European immigrants, particularly from Southern or Eastern Europe. And I came across one story of a woman who was coming to Blockton uh, from Eastern Europe, I think from Romania, and she spoke no English. Her husband was already here mining and she came across obviously on the ship, across the Atlantic and then by rail to get to Blockton. And all she had was a sign, cardboard sign, hung around her neck with a piece of string that says, Deliver to Joseph Bodner, Blockton, Alabama. <laughs> she made it. <laughs> so. Convict leasing came to the Cahaba field, not quite as prevalent uh, in the Cahaba field as it was in the uh, warrior field. And of course, uh, you may be familiar with the Banner Mine uh, tragedy, the explosion in 1912. Uh, only four mining communities in the Cahaba field use convicts. This is Bell Ellen, just east of Blockton in Bibb County. Uh, the Eureka Mines in Helena used, uh, used uh, convicts uh, for a time. Aldrich, after the Aldriches retired and moved up to Glen Iris in Birmingham, the subsequent owners brought uh, convicts in there from 1912 to 1926. And then Lucille in Bibb County uh, also used the uh, used convicts. And there was a similar tragedy there. Couple, two or three convicts tried to escape from Lucille by lighting a fire as a diversion so that they could get away. As it turned out, the barracks, barracks caught on fire and uh, really was a conflagration there. Many of them were still locked in their cells and so you had uh, a lot of folks who were killed there. But uh, uh, Alabama had the longest and most notorious convict leasing system and as you see here, from 1872 to 1927, there were many humanitarian efforts to get rid of the convict lease and at least get them out of the mines. And that dangerous work uh, finally happened in 1927 and 1928, not for humanitarian reasons, but because automobile was coming of age, you passed a gasoline tax so that you could offset the revenue generated by the coal mining leases. And uh, so you brought them out of the mines and put them in the road camps and the like. And this is a, an unusual picture. This is taken at Aldrich of convicts here, but unusual that it's daylight and they're outside. 
Often the entrance to the mine would be in the basement of the barracks. They'd get them up about three or four o'clock in the morning. They'd go down to the mines, come back anywhere between eight and 10 at night. So for the most part, the, the convict miners never saw the light of day. Uh, so this is, is definitely a unique picture. As you began building company towns, uh, then the dynamics changed a little bit. In the early days, these really were mining camps. You had single men who would go to the camps and do the mining, kind of like the gold rush out west and the like. So uh, really when you're talking about um, buildings and things like that, you had saloons, you had brothels, and perhaps a boarding house or two. But when World War I came along, many of your European immigrants went back to the old country to fight for their home country. Uh, and also many of the single men were drafted once the United States entered the war, which meant then that you started getting married men coming into the uh, mining areas, bringing their wives and their children. So then the companies had to begin providing some of the, the family-oriented services like schools, churches, uh, commissary, and the like. And of course, uh, Tennessee Ernie Ford has sung about owing your soul to the company store because they would just cut the, uh, the wages. And again, because they only got paid for the coal, then miners uh, typically were in debt, kind of like serfdom to a certain extent. This is my grandfather right here, worked for the commissary at the Little Cahaba Coal Company in Piper. Had a, uh, and I, I never knew him, but uh, uh, learned a little bit about him in, in doing my research. Uh, he had a dairy and a store about three miles from Piper, so essentially he was in business in competition with the commissary. When the miners went on strike in the winter of 1920 and 21, they were moved out of company housing. United Mine Workers of America provided a tent city, but they, they couldn't shop at the commissary, so they came and shopped at my grandfather's store, but they had no money because they weren't mining, so they weren't getting paid, so he gave them supplies on credit. And uh, when the miners lost the strike early in 21, as my dad tells it, only two families were able to repay their debt. So essentially my grandfather went bankrupt and uh, then went to work for the commissary for the, uh, for the rest of his working life. So uh, a <coughs> classic case of co-optation there. This is Scrip, uh, company money, essentially. They would either pay them in paper uh, tags like this or would have some coins or tokens that they called clacker or boogaloo uh, and so and could only get full value redeemed at the company store. Other folks would give a discount kind of like a pawn shop or something like that but again it keeps all the money kind of in-house uh, as far as the owners and operators are concerned. Talk some about welfare capitalism, the idea of kind of trying whatever you could to keep a contented workforce. This is a school at, Bro at Blockton. The companies would build, uh, in many cases, uh, here a specific school, but in other cases they just kind of build assembly halls, might serve as a saloon at night, uh, have church services upstairs in the morning, and then perhaps a school room uh, during the week and the like. Uh, would bring in teachers, pay them, give them a, a house there to teach the, the children. And then also social work was a, uh, was a significant profession here because the social workers would come in, help to assimilate uh, many of the immigrants who were here or folks who were just moving to a, a town type of environment for the first time, uh, teach them some assimilation, and then also uh, Americanization to a certain extent, teaching American values and things like that. Baseball was probably the sport of choice. Uh, there was some football, some basketball, some tennis and the like, but many of the company towns had baseball teams. Uh, some of them played in the Southern League with the Birmingham Barons and, and others uh, like that. Uh, this one is unique because it is a black baseball team. Uh, but I have talked with some folks, who, even many of these were drafted by the major leagues. Uh, World War II kind of interrupted their chance for fame and fortune and the like, but uh, often owners and operators would, would trade miners. Uh, so it was like an unofficial tr uh, trading going on with, with various players, and uh, they'd move from town to town because they, they wanted a, a ringer or a particular person to play on their baseball team, and then they'd alter their working time so that they could make practice and, and games and things like that. 
Bands were important as well for leisure and entertainment. Uh, you had vaudeville shows. Uh, you began to get the moving pictures and the like. So you would have theaters, opera, things like that in various places. This is the uh, company band at Margaret up in St. Clair County. Uh, I always like the dogs. You know, you, you can't have a good picture without a, a dog or two. But uh, all of these things kind of contributed to the community spirit and the, the sense of towns, but also contributed to that contented workforce that the, uh, that the owners and operators were looking for. Ultimately, what I tried to do here was, uh, I, I thought that the Cahaba field had a unique history separate from the warrior field that fed the Birmingham district. I found that to be true. But the other thing, once you get, in, get out of the technological or economic type of history, uh, what I tried to do was tell the story of the people, taking more of a social history approach and uh, maybe giving voice to some of those more obscure folks who did a lot of hard work, a lot of dangerous work, but really contributed uh, significantly to the economic and cultural development of our state. Thanks very much. Yes, sir. I um, wonder how Bessemer fits into this. Uh, Henry DeBard Laban uh, founded Bessemer in 1885 uh, for, with the intent of rivaling Birmingham uh, and, and challenging the uh, iron development there. Bessemer never uh, realized its potential. Frankly, uh, DeBard Laban got involved in a lot of land speculation and the lots and things like that where uh, a lot of the real estate was sold two and three times. Uh, so a lot of people made a lot of money, but it was kind of hollow money. It was a, an economic bubble of sorts. And uh, just because of the dynamics with the influx of TCI coming in and developing the area and then U.S. Steel ultimately coming in in, uh, in the early 20th century, everybody thought, oh good, U.S. Steel will come in and support all of this industry and, and help Birmingham become the Pittsburgh of the South. But J.P. Morgan wasn't interested in building Birmingham. He was interested in building Pittsburgh and uh, was, was interested in keeping Birmingham a, a subsidiary. And then you get into Pittsburgh plus pricing that, uh, that would drive the price of Birmingham steel up in comparison to, uh, to Pittsburgh steel. So Bessemer was uh, the brainchild of Henry DeBard Leva, but never really came to fruition. Good question. Thank you. Yes, sir. What sort of physical uh, evidence still remains? You mentioned the cemetery and the office building a family was trying to stabilize or maintain. But are there historical markers or any, any things that people can actually go to see that provides evidence of this activity? Uh, it, it's spotty at best. Uh, and the idea, many of these towns, are, there are 150, uh, were 150 coal towns in the Cahaba field that ranging from the mid 19th century to the mid 20th century. But the nature of things here is that when an operator would go in and say, all right, I'm going to extract the mine here. First thing he'd do is set up a sawmill. Then he'd start cutting board lumber. He'd build the, the uh, commissary or the office building, then start building company housing and the like. Once you shut down operations, there was no reason for those buildings to exist. So what they would do is they would sell the materials. Somebody would come in and buy that, so they'd tear it all down, take it off and build something else. There's a little town of Brantleyville just west of Alabaster that was built from the Straven mine. So you go to Straven or Seacard, there's nothing there. It's all in Brantleyville. Uh, similar with, with Piper and Coliner. Um, there is a historical marker, Piper on one side, Colina on the other, telling you it was there. When I was a kid walking that area with my dad, you could see the old railroads. There was no one of those old yellow stop signs. Uh, and then the tipple was still there. Uh, tipple caved in, you know, when I was uh, a teenager, I think, and the rest has been covered with dirt. Uh, but two things uh, still exist in Piper, the superintendent's home, which is a private residence now, and then the vault which was a, a concrete structure, the vault of the company store. The store is gone, but they left the concrete vault because they, they couldn't move that. So it's there. Uh, but it really is kind of relics uh, that, that are there. Now, there are a few towns like West Blockton, which was the commercial district for Blockton. Blockton's not there. 
Coke ovens are there, and there's a historical marker there, historical marker for the Italian cemetery, but Blockton no longer exists. Uh, West Blockton is still there uh, as, a, as a commercial or as an as a incorporated town. Aldrich stays as a community just west of Montevallo. Helena obviously is still around, but for the most part, uh, out of the 150 uh, mining operations, uh, no more than 10, 10 still exist as viable communities. I have not found any record of earthquake. Good, uh, good question. Thank you. Uh, obviously, the biggest threat was methane, and one of the things that I chose not to write a chapter on, I think it's kind of a separate entity, and other folks have talked about this, is, is the accident rate, and uh, certainly you, uh, it was dangerous work. Um, some, some mines were, were damp, and that would kind of keep the... Uh, uh, keep the gas uh, levels down, but if it was a dry mine, then you really had to monitor that and you never knew when it was going to explode. One of the uh, interesting things, too, about the uh, uh, Piper number 2 is that in 1952, I believe, somebody left the pump on overnight that, that kept the, the groundwater out, and it caught a fire, and then the seam, which is about 24 feet high, uh, caught fire. And so the only way to put it out was to pump it full of water from the Cahaba River. So they did that, and then they says, okay, fire's out now, let's drain the water. When they drained the water, the seam caught on fire again. It was that hot, and so finally they just closed it up. So there's still coal under there, but hey, if you open it, I don't know, maybe it'll catch on fire, I don't, I don't know. Uh, How many years did it continue to burn? Well, they closed it, I think, within a year after it, it started there, so you know, nobody knows, and it's still, it's still closed up there. So, uh, uh, but the explosions, and then you had other accidents. You know, it's dangerous work, uh, working with the rail uh, cars and things like that, uh, just being underground, cave-ins, uh, and, and we still hear accounts of that today in, in mining operations. So anytime you're underground, uh, there are a lot of things that can, that can go wrong. Yes, sir. I've heard that the coal industry is diminishing in Alabama. Is that right? It's just a limited it, number of years left. Yes, sir. It's diminishing. Uh, frankly, there's still coal there, and I've talked to some folks, you know, who talk about that. And, and really what happens is that once you get the easy coal, what's easy to get, then you go down, and I think over, uh, they're, they're still mining over toward Brookwood and over uh, toward Tuscaloosa in that area, and you still see the long coal car or coal trains going through and the like. But the Drummond uh, company that was up in, in Walker County did a lot of the strip mining back in the, uh, in the late 20th century now has moved to South America. And they're mining there because it's less expensive to mine it there, as long as you can control the drug cartels and the like, uh, or at least keep them uh, at bay, and then transport it to the United States. So it really is a uh, cost-benefit analysis. How expensive is it to extract? Now, these folks were doing a lot of hand mining and things like that. There's still coal there, as in Piper number two, uh, but it's a matter of how easy is it to get to and is it cost effective to get down there and, uh, and get it. So uh, there's still coal in Alabama. It's just a matter if it is uh, economically viable to do that. And of course, in the future, even if it were to, to uh, wane now, in the future, you might develop other technology that would allow you to go in and get it at a at an effective cost so that it becomes a viable business again. And then, of course, you have the other environmental issues about clean coal versus dirty coal and things like that, so we'll see how that goes. That becomes a political issue uh, as much as an economic issue. We have a question here. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. You mentioned the uh, companies trying to keep the unions out. Uh, I wondered what were the typical hours and wages and uh, uh, for a typical mine, you mentioned the the convicts, but uh, what was your typical lot? Was there a difference in the, the black miners and the white miners? You know, as a rule, let me start at the back and kind of work my way forward in your question there. Um, as a rule, equal pay for equal work. And uh, by the time coal mining really became a, a mature industry in Alabama, you had about 50 50 as far as blacks and whites. Underground, there was no segregation, there was no bias. 
because everybody was doing the same work, they were experiencing the same dangers, and they would get the same pay. Above ground, you still had segregation. White and black areas, and depending on what the uh, immig immigrant population was, you might even have three-way segregation. European, uh, so-called native-born or whatever, and then, uh, and then black communities uh, and the like. Um, there were different uh, and I outlined those in, in one of my chapters, frankly, in trying to pull that together. I said, how, how can I make sense of this? And what I did was I followed the railroads that connected the various mines there. And so you can kind of see, usually it was anywhere from uh, 80 cents a ton to maybe a dollar and seven cents a ton. And again, it's measured on the coal that's extracted, not on the amount of time put in or uh, you know, any of the other work that was done. Um, and of course, that then, the price of coal depended on how the markets were, and so then that would, uh, that would affect the, the wage that the various miners were, were earning. What volume would a ton of coal take uh, Most of the coal cars, and there's one down here, I think, from Tannehill, right? But it's about, uh, what, five feet by three or four feet, something like this, and that would uh, hold about two tons. Yes, sir. You said you study the social effects of the coal mining. Um, what effects did black lung disease have on the miners, and what were their life expectancy? You know, John Lewis, who was the president of the United Mine Workers of America from 1920 to 1960, uh, actually testified before Congress a lot in the 1950s. And from my study, uh, many of the uh, mining operations were either closed or closing by the time that came along. I think it was one of those uh, uh, work hazards that wasn't readily acknowledged initially, and only when you got into the 50s and the 60s and, and medicine, uh, the medical community started recognizing that. You started talking about treatments then, and unions got involved, Congress got involved to try to uh, afford some compensation for that type of thing. Did that really kind of hit the forefront? But uh, yes, it was significant. And obviously, folks would, would die of, of black lung along the way even before they knew what it was caused. But uh, particularly, and, and that's the, one of the issues about mechanization, is that you can mine more coal so you can make more money, but you're also churning up that fine coal dust, which means if there's gas, then you, it, you can have explosions and, and the spontaneous combustion type of thing. And then also, it's coating uh, the inner linings of the lungs as well. Um, which, which goes back to the other question about work hours or what have you. You could work, it depended on summer, winter, you know, what the demand was and things like that. But when the unions came in and started talking about 40-hour work week or 80-hour work day, for many of these miners, that was actually guaranteeing income. Otherwise, they might work two or three days a week, uh, not at all during the winter time, or rather in the summertime, if, uh, if they had enough coal stockpiled and they didn't need to extract anymore. So it was very irregular work, and you couldn't depend on, on a steady income, which is one of the arguing points that, that the unions made as they began to organize. Do we have another question? If not, uh, Dr. Day will be here for a few minutes after the program, and he would be glad to sign your book or um, uh, sell your book. We do have some here. And if you have any closing comments, we'd like to know. Uh, I don't know that I do, but, but uh, if, you, if you have the opportunity to, to read the book, I hope you will enjoy it. I think it touches a lot of different aspects. I certainly learned a lot and uh, met some interesting people, and I think the key thing that I would want to take away from this is that regardless of what we, we look at from a historical perspective, we talk about industry, we talk about economics, we can talk about politics, but ultimately history is made by people. People are always interesting. And uh, some folks who, who went before us worked mighty hard uh, to give us some opportunities that we have these days. So thanks very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you.